Hello, I'm Ari with Minerva, and in this video, I'll be showing you step-by-step -step how to make the 80 blouse. So let's begin with some supplies. You will need the pattern, of course, a pair of tweezers. I like to use these to remove pins, a pair of small scissors to cut off any small threads, matching thread for your fabric, some fabric, of course, I'm using a viscose chalet, some pins or clips, whichever you prefer, a seam ripper, for any mistakes you might make, a pair of scissors to cut out your fabric, and a rotary cutter, both with a dull and sharp blade. You can find the ED pattern on the website right now, or you can find the PDF and print it out, whichever works best for you. I prefer the actual pattern so that I can get started right away. This pattern has a dress and a top, and today I'll be showing you how to make the top, but the only difference is the length. This pattern is intermediate, but if you are a determined beginner, I have no doubt you could achieve this pattern for yourself. You'll see the finished measurements, the fabric requirements, and the suggested fabric. Let's take a look at the instructions. I always prefer to read the instructions once over before starting. That way when I actually get started, I already have an idea in mind of what I'm supposed to do. So there are two sheets with instructions on the front and the back. The first set of instructions are the sewing instructions, and it shows how to do all of the different steps to complete your ED blouse. So you can see in number one that it talks about your back shoulder darts and how to go about getting those properly finished, how to stay stitch your back opening so that you can prepare your back for your bias, how to prepare your back opening bias, and how to apply your back opening bias. You'll see that on number six, it shows you how to stitch diagonally once your bias is attached, your shoulder seams, how to finish those, and how to prepare and attach your back neck bias. They have a bunch of different steps here with instructions. You'll see that on the bottoms, there's instructions for each number, and it's quite clear and straightforward. And then if you flip it to the other side, you'll see that there are more instructions on how to do your side seams, how to hem, how to attach your sleeve, as well as put a buttonhole in your sleeve. And then when you're finished, this is what your blouse will look like. Let's talk about our next set of instructions. The set of instructions talks about the pattern pieces and how many there are. There are eight pieces total. It gives us the finished garment measurements, what the pattern markings mean, several cutout layouts for both the top and the dress so you can utilize your fabric in the most efficient way, and the sewing information. This information is important, whether you are intermediate or a beginner, and it is really helpful because it often lists what your seam allowances are for different sections. So be sure to check it out and read through it. Now let's take a look at our pattern so we can get to cutting. Another option if you don't want to cut directly into the pattern is to get tracing paper and trace your size onto it. The easiest way to achieve this would be to highlight your size in an easy to see color for all of the pattern pieces and then transfer it to new paper. However, I don't mind cutting directly into my size so I'm going to cut a size 10. I was able to find my size by taking my measurements and comparing it to the pattern's finished measurements. This is easier for me than choosing the size based on the unfinished measurements because for me, the finished measurements are a better indicator of how the garment will fit me. So I first like to separate the pieces from each other before I cut the specific piece as I find that to be easier. Then I will use my rotary cutter with an old blade and cut out my size from each piece. I find this method to be easier and faster than just using a pair of scissors. After you get your pieces all cut out, you'll want to look at the grain lines of each piece and then you'll want to figure out where they should go on your fabric. Here are a few images to help you understand which grain line is which and how to properly place your pattern according to its grain. You'll see in this main image the direction of the three different grain lines, the crosswise grain, the lengthwise grain, and the bias grain. The lengthwise grain is the most commonly used grain line in garment construction because it is stronger than the crosswise grain and it is less likely to stretch out of shape. The crosswise grain is less dense and has a bit more give when necessary than the lengthwise grain. The bias grain is the grain that is used to cut fabric at a 45 degree angle to our lengthwise and crosswise grains. The bias grain creates drape, follows curves, and creates a softness. In this image, you'll see what a garment looks like when it is placed on the fabric lengthwise and what era it will show on the garment. And in this image, you'll see how a garment looks crosswise grain, and in this one, bias grain. And in this final image, you can see how a garment will look when it is placed on the fold on the lengthwise grain. Now when you are cutting, you can use pins to keep your fabric and pattern together, or you can use pattern weights. I had some jars at my disposal, so that is what I used. 
I have even seen sewists use cans of beans, plants, mugs, anything really, as pattern weights, and I love it. As long as your pattern and fabric stay in place and you are cutting as accurately as possible, that is what is most important. Also, don't forget to mark all of your notches, this will come in handy later, I promise. So I'm using this really beautiful viscose chalet for this top. You will find that the different options for fabric are lighter weight woven fabrics, like linen, linen blends, poplin, hemp and hemp blends, cotton chambray, Indian hand weaves and block prints, tensile and tensile linen. Although viscose chalet is not directly noted on the fabric options, it is still a lighter weight woven, and I think it works perfectly with the pattern to provide both drape in the bodice as well as enough shape in the sleeves. However, if you want something that will make your sleeves more voluminous, you should go with something a bit more structured. It all depends on what look you're after. I'm going to begin by threading my machine with my thread and reviewing the instructions again step by step. So the first step is to sew the back shoulder darts. Since we have marked our notches, we'll see that there are two notches where the dart begins. You'll see that right here, and you'll want to fold these two notches together and sew to the bottom of your pinhole, which will be indicated on your pattern. When you reach the bottom of the dart, you'll want to be sure that you do not backstitch, that you cut the threads a little bit longer so that you can tie them together yourself. This will create a much neater dart. So we are going to sew the dart for both sides and then iron them to make them super crisp and nice. And it will look something like this on the back and something like this on the front. So the next step will be step number two, which is to stay stitch your back opening. Sewing this line will ensure that everything stays in place and does not come undone later. Since we cut a line directly in the middle of the fabric, sewing this line across keeps the fabric from fraying and keeps it safe. When we add our back bias, everything will stay in place properly. Our next step is to prepare our back opening bias by folding the edges in toward each other and ironing them in place. And in step number four, we're going to attach the bias with the right side of the bias facing the wrong side of the blouse. You will see that this makes sense later and when you fold over the bias to the wrong side, everything is done properly. So I'm going to show you this right now. This is the back of our fabric. We're going to take the right side of our bias, we're going to open it up a little bit like this. We're going to place it on the wrong side of the fabric. I know this might feel wrong right now, but it makes a lot of sense later. We're gonna pin this in place all the way around our back opening. And when we're done doing that, then we'll move on to the next step. As you can see, I like to be really careful about where I'm placing each of my pins. It's important to me that everything stays together super well, especially since this fabric is a little bit more slippery. If you're using something that has more structure, then you might not need to be as precise as I'm being. But if you're using something that is a little bit more slippery, you might want to be really sure about every piece and put as many pins as possible. So a little trick I like to do to make sure that my bias fits perfectly at the, the center of my fabric is to attach the remaining bias tape to the other side first and then slowly work my way down to the center. If there happens to be excess fabric from the bias tape, that's okay. You can just adjust it a little bit by little bit and then cut off the excess. But I like to work my way all the way down and make sure that everything is pinned properly so even at that V point, we don't have a problem. When I begin sewing, I like to make sure that everything is as flat as possible when it's going through the machine. I also turn my speed setting to the lowest setting and I like to use a pair of tweezers to remove my pins as I'm going because I find that to be a lot faster than just trying to take it out with my fingers. So you'll see here how everything is starting to look. It's starting to look good, but I'm going to cut off the extra little bits that we don't need. We don't need this piece. This piece extended out and that's just fine. Everything is fitting properly. So we're gonna cut that right off. 
And then another option you have here, instead of cutting like I'm doing, you can of course cut. You can also just put little notches across the entire thing and that will kind of help it open up a little bit more. But for me, I just wanted to remove the extra. Just be really careful that you don't cut off your line of stitches because you need those. <laughs> um, but you can see that I'm taking my time with this and making sure that I am close to my stitches, but not too close. And then when we are done with that, we will flip everything over and we will begin to pull our bias to the front. You can see that we have this fold that we made before when we ironed our bias together. This is just gonna go right on top of our fabric. So we're going to take our time pulling the bias tape from the other side of the fabric, making sure that it sits flatly across our back opening. We're going to pin everything in place as you can see that I'm doing here with as many pins as necessary and then we're going to sew it all down as straight as possible. If you're using a slippier fabric like I am, you're going to want to use more pins so that it doesn't move as you sew it. So now that my bias tape is pinned in place, I'm going to take my time sewing it down. I am sewing close to the edge and to do that I am using the side of the presser foot to line against the edge of the bias tape and I am using it as a guide to get as close to the opening edge of the bias tape as I can without going off the edge. I like to take my time sewing everything in place so that when I am finished it looks really nice. Another option if you don't want the stitches to show is to stitch in the ditch on the wrong side instead of on the right side like we are doing here. Once everything is stitched down, we will move on to the next step. So now we'll take a look at our next step in the instructions, which is number six, and it is telling us to stitch diagonally across the bottom of the bias. So we will take that over to the machine, but I first like to pin everything in place to make sure that everything is aligned perfectly. So then when I stitch the diagonal, everything is as perfect as possible. So as you can see here, I repositioned my pin to be a little bit higher and now I'm going to stitch and then I'm going to back stitch. And then when I'm finished with that, I'm going to cut off all of my extra threads right here. And when you finish and you open everything up, just like I'm doing right now, the back of your bodice will look like this, which is super cute and nice, and I love how it turned out. So we will review the instructions again and move on to step number seven, which is to attach our shoulder seams. So I'll take my front and back pieces and take my time attaching them so that each piece lines up perfectly. So you will see the notches we marked on our front piece. We are going to put our front and our back piece right sides facing, and we're going to pin them together. Of course, my recommendation is to take your time pinning everything in place, making sure both pieces line up properly, and then we will sew both sides together. When we are finished sewing the shoulders together, we will either use a zigzag or overcast stitch on our sewing machine or a serger to finish off our edges. I will be using my serger to finish mine. However, if you want to avoid raw edges showing at all, you could instead do a French seam. You'll just need to make sure of the seam allowances and make sure that your French seam uses the seam allowance correctly. It just depends on what kind of finishing you want to do and what kind of time you have. Now that 
we are done with our shoulder seams, we will begin working on step number nine, which is to attach our neck binding to our neckline. You can see that the shirt is folded in a specific way to attach the neck binding to the neckline properly. So you'll want to fold your shirt in half, but allowing your front and back to be separate as I'm doing here. If that is at all confusing, review the image on the instructions a few more times. I will start by marking the front and back middles of my neckline, and I do the same thing with the bias binding by marking the half point. Once I have marked both points, I take both pieces and place them together with the pins. So you can see that my bias binding is marked with the pin in the half point. I will do the same thing on the shirt in the back. You can see that I'm pinning in place here. And once I have my points marked with pins, I take both pieces and place them together. Then I will pin the whole neckline all the way around and sew it in place. Once it is all sewn in place, I will then cut off the excess fabric so as to avoid bunching in my bias binding. Then I will turn everything over and pin it all in place very carefully like we did before so that it is as neat as possible. You can see here that I am closing my binding at the edge where the opening begins and then I'll work my way down to the end of the tie. Once I finish pinning from the end of the tie, then I'll continue through the rest of the neckline until the whole thing is pinned in place and then I will sew it all together and then you can see that this is how it looks when it is all finished. It's really exciting to get to this point in the shirt because you can start seeing that everything is starting to come together, which is super exciting. I love how the binding turned out. You can see it from the front and the back and then I actually tie it in place just to see how it will look when it's done. There you have it. This is how the tie looks when it's all placed together. It looks really lovely. I love how the binding turned out. And now we will work on closing our side seams and then we will attach our sleeves and then hem everything in place. We are very close to being finished, so keep on pushing through. Now we are going to hem our sleeves with enough room to either feed our ties through or our elastic. You will notice that on the instructions it mentions sewing a buttonhole to feed our ties through. You can either do that or if you think your fabric is less likely to fray, you can just cut a hole, which is what I did. So now we are going to pin our sleeve sides together and then we are going to sew them in place. And then when we are finished, this is how our sleeves will look. Now we're going to serge off the raw edges like I'm doing here and then finish off our ties like I'm doing here. And then I'm going to feed our ties with a safety pin through the hole that we've created. Either we did a buttonhole or just we cut a hole through. Then I'm going to put the whole thing through, tie it off, and then I'm going to flip it outward, tie it off again just to make sure that it fits my wrist properly and then I'll put my arm through just because I'm excited to see how it's gonna look when it's all done. And I can already tell that I am loving how this is looking. Just look at that sleeve and the volume. And now I'm going to pay attention to my notches on my shoulder seams. I'm going to attach the sleeves with the same matching notches. You'll see that there is a one notch and then there are two notches. You want to match those up together because that indicates the front and the back because the sleeve has a front and a back side. And if you don't attach it properly, it won't fit properly. So I'm going to match up the notches, pin it in place, and then I'm going to sew everything together, serge everything, and then we'll be done. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope that this tutorial was really helpful and that you love your shirt just as much as I love mine. I am Ari from Minerva. See you next time.